Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 429 of the podcast. Thank you all for tuning in. Today on the show, I've got a live episode that was taped back in May of this year at the Envision Woodfire North Carolina Conference. I'm joined on stage by Steve Blankenbecker, Takaro Shibata, Josh Kopis, and Hideo Mabuchi to talk about the discovery and use of locally dug clays. If you'd like to find out more about the ceramic research that's being done at Starworks, as well as their residency program. You can find that at starworksnc.org. Also wanted to take a minute to thank the folks that have been donating to our 10-year fund drive. We are listener-supported, so I'd like to thank Nick Kessler, Denise Wyden, and Deb Sullivan for their contributions. If you'd like to get involved, we are ending that fund drive with a bang in the month of August, so every new and renewing patron on Patreon gets a free t-shirt in addition to their normal perks. You can sign up for that today at patreon.com slash redclayrambler. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. I'm Ben Carter, and I'm a podcast producer, host, and potter. So a lot of what I do is actually talking to people about their lives, their work, and their creativity. And you're going to hear us talk a lot about this idea of clay 2.0. But before we can talk, that that sounds futuristic, right? You know, like we're going to like zoom off into space on our favorite Kalen or something like that. Um, but before we can get to clay 2.0, we need to talk about clay 0.5, which is geology you know, which is where all this comes from. So we're actually going to start with that. And I thought I would, I would have Steve maybe explain a little bit uh, about why North Carolina is unique geologically and why there's so much clay around here. Um, North Carolina is extremely unique in that we have a lot of diverse uh, geology, and uh, that plays well into the different types of clay that we have. Uh, I'll probably miss one or two, but... Uh, if you start in the mountains, we have uh, the Appalachian Mountains, which have a lot of granite. So when you weather granite, you get a uh, kaolin, among other things. So we have primary kaolin in North Carolina, which means it formed in place. Um, you don't really see primary kaolin available commercially anymore, but uh, for those that have been around for a little while, the, the commercial kaolin that most people would remember that was primary would be Avery. So if you ever see Avery kaolin show up in a, in a recipe, that's a primary kaolin that came out of the North Carolina mountains. Uh, the next thing that you see in North Carolina, which you also see in any, any area that you go to, is floodplain clays. These would be recent age clays, and they can be in a very shallow area. Uh, they can be very localized. They can also be very broad in a river valley that runs for uh, uh, several miles. You can find those about anywhere, but those are all over North Carolina, too. Uh, we're also right now in what is called the North Carolina Slate Belt, a uh, volcanic activity that took place 400 million years ago. Um, so we have volcanic activity, and you have a lot of ash deposits. Um, in this area right here, you have ash deposits that are like the um, candor clay that comes from um, Starworks. Uh, you also have the famous Mitchfield clay from Seagrove that is also an ash deposit. You also have volcanic rock that decomposes over time to give you a soft material that has some clay properties, and a, a Starworks material like that would be Okawimi. Uh You also have in North Carolina, believe it or not, we have coal uh, down near Sanford. Uh, not a lot, but there is a history of coal mining. You actually have true underclay fire clays in North Carolina, much similar to clays like gold art clay and Roseville clay that you typically think of from Ohio. We actually have those here. And the last clay that's, that's pretty major in North Carolina is we're in the Kalen Belt, 
which is when the uh, Atlantic Ocean was up into inland probably 100 miles. Uh, the Kalen Belt will run from up near Norfolk, Virginia, all the way down through the Carolinas, down through Columbia, South Carolina, on into uh, Georgia, on over into Alabama. And that's where you get your really high quality white Kalen clays. But we also have less high quality white Kalen clays in North Carolina. And uh, those combination of those different geological features give North Carolina just a, 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 a really good assortment of available clay types that you wouldn't see a lot of places. Aren't you glad that we asked him to be on this panel? Dang, like, Steve. Steve is the smartest. Let's hear it for Steve. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. I love when people can, can put their experience into words like that, but I realized I was jumping ahead. I didn't even introduce our panel, so I'm going to have you guys introduce yourselves and what I want you to do is just say your name and then what your position is in what you do like if you're a researcher clay whatever you do so I'm gonna start with you okay uh, I'm Takuro Shibata I'm a director of Starworks Ceramics and also a studio potter so my job in Starworks is um, researching North Carolina, North Carolina local clay and uh, we have a clay making facility we call clay factory and uh, we are making local uh, clay bodies and then many of the clay coming from Steve's but uh, so that's one thing I oversee and then we have a artist in residency program in clay studio so we have that so those are the my job at Starworks and then uh, my studio put part I have a uh, studio in Seagrove and uh, my wife Hitomi and I built wood kiln there and uh, making functional pottery. Uh, I'm Steve Blankenbaker and I am the ceramic engineer for Taylor Clay Products which makes uh, brick in Salisbury, North Carolina. We're about an hour away from here and I've been there since 2002. From 1984 to 2002, I was the engineer for Cedar Heights Clay Company, uh, which we all know Cedar Heights. Um, and that's where I really got to know a lot about clays. Uh, Cedar Heights is very good to cater to the art pottery and the art ceramic industry, which is um, not always the best business model for a company, but I'll give them... I'll, I'll give them credit for being in that and being in it since uh, I had records of red art being mined in 1934. So uh, they're going on and they've been in business since 23. So they're going on almost 100 years. Uh, and, and I can tell you that it's, it's kind of a tough business to sell to the, the art potters. Uh, so what I do for Taylor Clay, Taylor Clay makes all colors of brick. So we have to get all different colors of clay. We go as far as uh, Central Ohio. Uh, the other side of Birmingham, Alabama, as well as mining locally. And I say this kind of humorously, but I always tell people I'm the clay miner to the stars because uh, Mr. Taylor that owns the company is very um, sympathetic to the, to the pottery industry and he, and he works with you and he wants me to interact with you. So with his blessing, I'm here today and, uh, and uh, a lot of you that have, I always try to, if you come visit us at Taylor Clay and it's an interesting place to visit, I always try to uh, get you a chance to meet Mr. Taylor because he, he really appreciates what you do and he likes to contribute and he's been doing that in an assortment of ways for a number of years. I'm Hideo Mabuchi and by training and by profession I'm a scientist. Uh, in particular, I am professor of applied physics at Stanford University, and in my day job, I work in a field called quantum optics. Um, but I also make pots and I wood fire, and for a while now, I've been very interested in the kind of intersection of traditional craft and modern science, and what the two communities can, can really teach each other. So Hideo is the uh, 2.0 part of this uh, conversation, <laughs> and we're going to get to that a little bit later. <laughs> Great. I'm Josh Kopis. I'm a studio maker and wild clay enthusiast, wild clay hype man. I'm the ditch guy. When me and Steve go out, not really afraid of the snakes or the spiders. And, uh, Ticks and poison ivy. Yep, yep. I'll get right down in there. So that's, that's kind of my role. And uh, I've been working with wild clays 
since uh, I met a, a guy that uh, had a, a drainage problem in a tobacco field in uh, 2004, and uh, I just got a bunch of clay out of his field, and and um, then we became really the best of friends. So, and that's just a, a whole amazing story. That's the start of my journey with the with the wild clay. So, well, I'm I'm glad that you said that because a lot of times clay is discovered in unusual ways. Like a farmer has a drainage problem, and they intuitively know like there's probably clay under there because I can't get that field to drain. But then once you find the clay, or once Josh found the clay, then getting that clay out of the ground and testing it is like the first thing. Or maybe actually figuring out how to get a truck to that spot <laughs> so you don't have to hike like five miles in to get that clay. Yeah, my, my strategy was uh, all, like I was a student doing a research project, and that, that's actually a really good thing to say. Gets you like in a lot of spots. It could get you out of a little bit of trouble too, so... Well, well, once you guys identify where a clay is, and actually, let's start with you, Josh. Once you identify this is a clay source, what are the steps you're going to take to be able to identify what type of clay you found? Well, I mean, I, I, I started out, I have a very, like, empirical kind of uh, actually fairly non-scientific strategy. And, and I think one of the important things with working with wild clay is just to play to your own strengths. Um, so I'm, I'm a very trial and error oriented person. And I, I started out just by like reading a bunch of books about old folk potters that describe the types of clay. And it really is simple as that. And, and what I found is, is that my, my whole clay strategy is, is actually based on human relationships. And, and uh, the first clay that I ever dug, it was a wonderful example of that. Um, and, and, what I've found through the years is um, finding a clay is pretty easy, but finding a property owner that's willing to let you dig a big hole in their property is, is not as easy. And um, sometimes people start asking questions like, well, how much is this worth? Or what are you going to pay me? And those are pretty big red flags for me. So um, I think the first step is, is really like finding someone who's willing to let you harvest clay off of their land. And that's all just like human relationships and talking. Now, Takaro, can you talk about once you, on, on, a, on the Starworks level, because it's a, it's a, you guys can get larger amounts of clay because you're making clay for all of us out here. Once you identify where a clay is, what is your guys' process to be able to run it through the paces to test it? Yep. Um, when we get the clay, buckets of clay from Steve or other artists, we, of course, are taking some clay and then fire it to see what we can do. And then uh, that's including uh, making textiles, a bar, and then shrinkage, and also water absorptions in a different temperature range. But um, we wish, uh, we hope, we can just uh, use the clay by itself after we take out from the ground. But most of the time, it doesn't work. So <laughs> we need to blend them together, adding some, uh, like, in, in North Carolina, clay is high temperature. So normally, we need to add some feldspar to make firing, maturing temperature lower. So that kind of test we do. But uh, when we started uh, Starworks uh, clay researching project, we thought many people like to have a low clay straight. So we hammer milled and we uh, provided those to the people. But no many people buy it <laughs> because it's uh, too much to and not many people cannot use it. Uh, many people curious. So people buy 15 pound and then test it. Oh, that was great. But you have to make 500 pounds or a thousand pounds. That's too much for most of the people. Maybe some people use for grays or uh, gray strip 
but that's many people cannot make cravery from the raw materials. So we couldn't sell much. And then we thought uh, we have to make a cravery with the local materials so then people can use without um, spending too much uh, time and uh, equipment uh, space in their studio. So then Starbucks put uh, equipment in uh, downstairs in Cray Factory and then set it up. Then after we start producing Cray by the local, local, Cray, local North Carolina wild Cray buddies, so then people yeah, start using more. So that's kind of the story we have. And then, of course, many artists, uh, Ben Owens, Josh Corpus, uh, Mark Hewitt, many people helped us to get the idea about uh, cray buddies and also different cray sources. So it's been wonderful to connecting people with the wild cray materials. And that's the most fun part doing uh, local cray testing or uh, wild cray, uh, working with the wild cray. Ben, if I could just add something, and maybe Steve, you'd like to talk about this. I think one of the really special things about Starworks is is like, it, like the scalability. Like it's a big operation, but it's actually not that big. It's kind of like in the sweet spot. So there's a lot of materials that are available that are in the ground that just aren't economically viable to extract. And Takaro's uh, teaming up with Steve like Steve can make materials available to Takaro that like n normally you just can't get um, because of the scale. So, you know, a really like, I think the, the, where you're at with the level of production, it's like, it's, it's much bigger than my operation, but it's not so big that, um, you know, you need to have like a resource that's like billions of metric tons of clay. You know, you're working in like a dump truck scale, which is pretty unique. And like me and Steve talk about this all the time, that ma ceramic materials are, are like coming off the list. Like clays, and it's not oftentimes like they're running out of that material. It's like there's another economic thing happening in the industry that's making it not viable to mine. That's what's going on, so... Yeah, can you explain that, Steve, like economic viability, what that means for you guys? Yeah, one thing that, and, and let me again mention Taylor Clay products because uh, my boss and Taylor Clay's owner, Charles Taylor, makes a lot of this possible because um, we can go out, Tucker and I could go out somewhere and we could find some clay and I call my contractor and I say, we want to get a backhoe in here. We want to get two truckloads of material and... Um, He'll give me a price. Taco and I will look at it and we'll figure out, okay, we're going to get 40 tons of material out of the ground. We're going to have an excavator come in on a low boy. It's going to have a, it's going to have a two or three yard bucket. We're going to have permission to dig. We're going to have the landowner taken care of. And sometimes as quick as three or four days, we might have two truckloads of material in here, which might last quite a while. Well, we can do that. Uh, you're not going to get that happen very often without the right players in place. And it's not, it's not really me. It's a contractor that Takaro knows. He's part of our company, a man that mines us six different materials and mines us a hundred thousand tons a year, but he'll go get Takaro, uh, 40 tons of material. We're working with, um, a group down in Camden, South Carolina. We're going to, we're going to help them find some clay. We found some really unique materials down there. We don't know where all that's going to go. But the ability here with Starworks to be able to take a dump load of clay dumped today and have some kind of pottery clay in production for y'all within a, a month, nobody else can really do that. And I, and I always try to give this example. If, if everybody here was in a cake baking competition and you had to use bags of clay as the ingredients, y'all only have seven, six or seven materials to pick from. 
Everybody knows them. You got Hawthorne, Missouri fire clay. You got a couple of clays from Cedar Heights. You've got an assortment of ball clays, but they kind of all fall into the same line. You have a couple of feldspars left. You have a few things. You don't have a whole lot out there, and you lose them all the time because the your market's not big enough to sustain this exotic feldspar or this exotic ball clay. As as domestic ceramic industries have diminished. You've lost that. Your industry piggybacked off of, off of this China company or that porcelain company. That's not there anymore. So the ability to do that. And one thing that, 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 that us that go looking for clays all the time is we recognize that exotic material. I know I got an exotic material right now in South Carolina. We know that this material is exotic. We know the things that would help. It's not going to help for us to find another kaolin. That's not going to help. But we're always looking for things like high fire red and some different things that would really mean something to your to your market and to your business. Nobody else is looking for that. It takes it takes us. If Josh goes up into the mountains, North Carolina, he finds something exotic. Uh, he might come to me and say, Steve, we got this thing over here. This is really, really good. I think Takaro would like it. Let's see. Let Takaro see it. And within our little fraternity, there's about 10 of us that. Uh, if one of us gets a sample, pretty much all 10 of us get a sample, and we see if it's got some viability on a small scale or on a bigger scale here. Uh, but it's, it's not going to be. And, and, and in my business, I'm always looking for things to help the brickyard, too. So I'm not just looking for pottery clay. Um, I've got to look for volumes of clay if I'm going to make brick. I can look at very, very, very small isolated clays for Josh a little bit bigger here. But in the case of Takara, we want to be certain at his volume of usage that he's going to have clays there 10 years from now. So each one's a little different, but uh, that's but, kind but of But even all of that is smaller than like a, a, a Cedar Heights operation, you know, where like that, they're mining that same site. Cedar for- Heights will mine about, will process about eight to 10,000 tons of red art clay a year. And I don't know how much that goes into ceramics, but a lot of it goes into brick coatings, a lot of things you don't think about. They'll mine about 2,000, 2,500 tons of uh, gold art. Um, but, but think about this, Cedar Heights, when, when I was there and things were going really good, we were moving 110,000 tons of clay a year. 2,000 tons was gold art. 2% of that business was gold art. So. Starbucks only process 350 tons a year, so that's very small. But we don't want to be largest clay company in the United States. We want to use local materials, and uh, that's precious materials to make a clay body. And uh, we cannot make that much, but we try our best. But that's 350 tons that we could make, and. Uh, we also think it's really good educational opportunity for artists too to see how we process clay. So Starworks is Starworks started the internship program that people can learn how we process clay too. So we try not to just uh, making clay for profit. It's not for that. It's for great building the community and then people learn from that yeah and if i could just add something real quick too like on this topic of scalability like the way that takaro processes clay and the way i process clay and the way that you can process clay in your studio is all the same way and and you know they're doing it with with bigger machines and filter presses and i'm doing it with like smaller machines and drying racks but you can do it with a five gallon bucket and a drill and a pillow sack so this stuff is like the scale of it is really up to you and and one one of my jobs as an advocate for wild clay is is just help to make it seem accessible because it really is and people come up to me all the time and they're just like you know like how do i do it you know and i'm just like it's you you can just dig it out of the ground and like make stuff with it. Like it's actually that simple. Like people think they're like, how do I process it? I'm like, do you have to? Like, that's a real question. Like you can just dig a clay out of the ground and make something out of it right then and there. I always do that first. Every time I get a clay, I use it 100% 
and it might make a great pot, it might not make a great pot, it doesn't actually matter because what I'm doing at that point is just familiarizing myself with the material and then I figure out the application and how to draw out its beauty best. But, but this stuff like that we're talking about, you can do it in your studio at home with a five gallon bucket and a drill. Well, I'm going to bring Hideo into this conversation. When we were prepping for this interview, we were talking about the difference between West Coast wild clays and East Coast wild clays and how they're similar, but they're actually not that similar. <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about how you got into wild clay by way of, of Utah, actually? Oh, okay. Yeah, um, you know, so stepping back just half a step, I was going to say that I really kind of dove headfirst into ceramics as a way of kind of escaping from the professional side of, of physics. Uh, and, but discovering wood fire then was a really interesting thing that kind of brought me halfway back. As you can imagine, as a person with a, with a, with a physics background, the first time you kind of put a very dull beige bisque pot into a, a wood kiln, fire it, and then see the range of colors and textures that come out, you want to know what's going on. And so, you know, that for me has been the real spark that not only, I think, drives what I try to do in the studio when I'm making pots, but also, you know, has been that kind of uh, keystone for kind of understanding how the interests that I might have as a scientist really go together with the, the kind of interests that I have uh, just in, in the materials and the, and the processes of, of traditional craft. And so that really has been able to come together over the past few years, largely because of this close collaboration that I have with uh, John Neely and Dan Murphy and everybody uh, over there at Utah State University, where I kind of started out with a common interest in trying to understand what was going on with reduction cool reds. And so that led to a kind of uh, working method where we would do things like make pots and fire them in the train kilns at USU. I kind of don't like the idea of doing experiments in a laboratory because that's not fun. But it's, you know, it's fun to make pots and go out and fire with those guys in Logan. So we would fire things there, but then I would take pieces back into the laboratory, cut them up, and sort of start looking at things with microscopes and gradually try to, 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 try to, uh, to develop a story about how to understand what happens in something like the reduction cool process. And what's been really kind of fascinating to, to appreciate is that you know, Steve started us off by talking about geology and kind of the origins of clay as just weathered minerals of the Earth's crust. But now the way that I've come to think about what we're doing at wood firing is basically when you have your pots in the kiln at high temperature, unglazed, but, you know, the kiln atmosphere is really fluxy, right? You've got a lot of sodium and potassium gas in there. And so that leads you to have a, a kind of a liquid layer on the surface of your pots at high temperature, which is really not that different from magma. And then all the action in terms of how color develops, that actually happens not so much while you're firing, but actually as you're cooling. And so really what you're doing is you're making little gemstones all over the surface of your pots. And what kind of minerals you end up making, that's what determines the colors that you get. And so really what we're doing when we wood fire is we're trying to guide that process along and steer it towards colors and textures that we do like and try to steer it away from colors and textures that we don't like. And so this is, of course, exactly what geologists study as igneous petrology, or kind of how magma turns into rocks. Um, but, you know, we're doing it in a very different, under very different conditions, right? We're very fluxy. We're at, you know, standard pressure. We're not deep down in the earth. And, um, yeah, we, we can keep things in reduction down to really low temperatures if we want. But so, yeah, that's, a, that's kind of been the, the entry point for me in terms of thinking about uh, uh, how physics relates to, to wood fire and, and clays. One of the things I, I love about this panel is that essentially we have two people that are doing re research on the front end, digging clay, processing clay, and, and Josh also. And then we have two people at the end that are doing a lot of research on the back end. So with Josh, I would imagine it was as simple as getting a pot out of the kiln and saying yay or nay. You know, like, I do like this kiln, the way it's firing, I like the clay. Um, but then with Hideo, you're, you're doing a level of scientific research, or at least with the optics and the imagery, that I don't think <laughs> when you're digging out in your farmer's field to discover that clay, you're, that no one's really thinking about taking an a, a optical picture of that level of quality. So do you guys think at all about how research works in that way? Like, I guess I have a question about collaboration. You, you all depend on other people to do the research you do. So how do you set up a good collaborative relationship either with another material scientist or with the farmer or with whoever you're working with? 
Um, I'll, I'll just I'll just tell you my experience. I think I think all of us, including all of you out there, if 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 I took you out to look for clay, we would pick up something, and I think that we would real quick analyze that whether we chew the clay or we roll it into a coil or we do something. We can recognize right away if we've got something that forms well. That's a that's that's a quick easy test. You're going to get excited in the field real quick. Okay, the next step is to bring it back and to fire it. In my case, I always take it to cone five. I want to see what it does at cone five. Now, I don't care if it's, I want to see some vitrification, obviously. I want to see some color. But the next step for me is to see what it does. If at cone five, it's pretty well vitrified, I want to see what it looks like at cone two. If it's not vitrified at cone five, I want to see what it looks like at cone eight. I personally want to see a nice, linear sloping down firing curve. If I see that, then I know that I have a clay that's going to mature in a nice fashion. It's going to tighten up over a long period of time. It's got a long firing curve. I like that. In North Carolina, you'll walk around, you'll get mud on your shoes, but I can tell you right now, 99% of what you get on your shoes will have a flat firing curve. It will, it will darken but it won't tighten up and it'll go to the end and melt real quick at the end and have a real short firing curve. And you'll be disappointed because it felt so good. And that's, that's the thing that you have to experience kind of tell you that. But that's when we start seeing something that's got the firing curve. And I can say whether it's a clay that matures at cone five or one that matures at cone 11, we all get excited when we see that that's got that nice firing curve. And that's, that's, that's what I look for. I look for that for brick because it, my, my, my brick tunnel kilns, I don't want something that gets not vitrified and vitrifies real quick. I'll have a terrible time with a brick and you'll have a terrible time with a pot that way too. So that's personally what I kind of look for. And when I get something that's kind of doing that, uh, I look at it more as an art form than a science. But if I get something good, I'm gonna go tell Takaro, here's a bucket of this. You tell me what you think of this. This is what I'm seeing and Every once in a while, they'll get all excited. And, and the community around here in this area, I've got, I've got 10, 12 uh, potters that have a real keen interest in something different. They're waiting for that next something different. Whether they ever use it or not, they're willing to help. They're willing to help me. They're willing to help Takaro, willing to help Starworks. And, uh, uh, but there's, there's, there's quite a few in the area that are really excited, and they'll all work together. To, to, to test something new and, and different because of the thing that there's only so many ingredients out there. If through Starworks we can come up with a high fire red and we're working on it. He's not been too involved in it yet, but down the road we think we found a really, really nice cone seven red burning clay in South Carolina that throws really, really well. And we've, we've had some tests, we've got some stuff. The next step is working on the logistics of trying to get it out. It's not a big deal to get 40 tons. I'm not trying to use it in, in brick, but if we can give you something that's almost a clay body on its own that fires red at cone seven or eight, uh, there'd be a lot of interest in that. So, One of the things as far as collaboration that I love the most is like if, like my, my friendship with Steve is probably like the most valuable thing that like at, that has come out of any of this. Like we run around and look for clays and, and when I first got started, you know, I had this idea like that if I had like a magical clay that no one else had, it would like make me make better stuff. And, and the, the beginning of that was like, you know, I was kind of end gaming this thing, thinking like that the material was the most important part of what I was doing. And, and, you know, through the years I've, I've learned, and this has just been reinforced. And like, if you look at the photos that I put in this slideshow, it's just photos of people pretty much like digging clay with smiles on their faces. And, you know, Steve's a great example for me because I, I really love strengths and weaknesses in human beings and recognizing those in myself and then partnering with people whose strengths complement my weaknesses. And Steve is an engineer and, and, you know, his brain is very different than mine. And, and I love that, you know, like when, and, and I think we learn from each other because, you know, Steve will be like, 
it's very linear, man. And, you know, I'm always like over there like, well, look at this weird stuff that's like got all the sand in it, you know? And, and like, we just like different things, but we, we, we share the, the main interest in the main thing. And, and, um, you know, I think that's the, the biggest takeaway is, is, um, you know, the material itself is very special, but the friendships and the, and the opportunities, you know, me and Steve, uh, you know, very different people from very different backgrounds. And, and I love that the, the clay has brought us together. And, and that's just one example, but I've got hundreds of those. So, you know, I think that aspect of the collaboration is, is you know, a, a very important thing that should be acknowledged. Oh, yeah, I mean, I, I would maybe just pull together a little bit both of the things that Steve and Josh just said that I feel like in any kind of setting, collaborations really work best when people did bring different things to the party, but you get excited about similar stuff, right? And, it, you know, it, it's, it's better to have people that you want to work with and you just find constructive things to work on together rather than saying, okay, here's my fixed goal and I'm going to try to bring together people to do it. Like, that's very hit or miss. But if you just have people that you want to find an excuse to work with, that's when it really works, right? Totally. <laughs> yep. Uh, for collaboration, I think the best collaboration I have is Steve, for sure, <laughs> like Josh said. And uh, the second one is when I started Starworks uh, Clay Research Project in 2005, I don't know anything about this area, so Porter's giving me, maybe you should check there and uh, uh, over there. And also, I talked to local soil scientist, and uh, he took me to many different locations, and uh, we dig uh, clay by uh, shovel and, and then collect in the bucket, and then uh, took it to Starworks and then test it. And also he gave me the map, like a geology survey map, where the clay uh, goes. Like if we get this type of uh, white uh, volcanic ash type mo of materials, the soil survey map shows like this way. So maybe we can find similar materials in Seagro, but also a little bit other places too. So that was good uh, collaboration. And uh, I don't know if I could say this or not, but um, our friend Mark Hewitt have a good friend who are working in university to uh, analyze the materials. So sometimes Mark ask the person to check his clay, but Mark told me, Send, send me, send me my, your clay. So maybe I can put that into the <laughs> a sample with my clay. And then he sometimes help, uh, testing, uh, clay, I mean, clay through the friend in the university too. So I, I'm really appreciate that sometimes, uh, those analysis is not, um, it's nice to know those information. It's not, clay is not the grays. So it's not 100% work just through the analysis, but it's nice to know those informations too. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Amico Brent. For the past 100 years, Amico Brent has been creating ceramic supplies for our community, ranging from underglazes to electric kilns, and they have no plans of slowing down. With over 3,000 products, Amico Brent's top priority is making sure that all of their customer needs are met. From the professional to the student and everyone in between, their high-quality materials enable you to make your best work. To learn more, check them out at amico.com or on Instagram and Facebook at Amico Brent. You can also show them how you use Amico by sharing your work online with the hashtag HowIAmico. Today's episode is brought to you by the Rosenfeld Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. The collection exists as an online resource for research and inspiration, featuring photos of thousands of objects made by over 800 artists. The images are high quality and can be used with no permission required, making them a great resource for students and teachers. To find out more, visit rosenfieldcollection.com.
So the last thing that I wanted to talk about is the difference between correlation and causation. So a lot of times in ceramics, and I was guilty of this when I was a young student, I would be like, I swear to get this result, you have to do X, Y, and Z. And in reality, after talking to material scientists, they're like, actually, it's QRS. You're looking at the wrong thing. Like, you're, you're putting meaning on one thing that actually is not right. But it was similar. So I, I, I guess the question that I have is when you're doing research, how do you figure out definitively, like, this clay is what I'm looking for, or, or this clay behaves this way for this reason? Because there's a lot of myths in ceramics. And, and the four of you could probably dispel a lot of myths that I even hold, even though I've been in clay a long time. So how do you guys figure out, like, what is the actual truth of a material through your research? Well, I think one of the first things that I always hear from someone is that they're worried that they're going to, like, melt the clay in the kiln. And I'm always like, if you do that, call me, let me know about that, because I'm actually really interested in that. <laughs> you know, because especially around here, like if you find a clay that melts in the kiln, that's actually a glaze, and, and I would love to find out where that is. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's not a thing to be like afraid of. That, I think that's a, the, one of my big takeaways, is people are like scared that they're gonna mess something up, and I would just eliminate that. And, just burn it. See what happens. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'll, I'll maybe just say, you know, kind of connect to this idea of why should you ever bring science into the studio or try to think about something like wood fire pottery from a, a scientific perspective. And, you know, what you find is when you go around and talk to people that have their materials, they have their kiln, they know what to do. People know exactly what to do to get the results that they want in general. But the one thing about it is that, well, let's say that you want to pick up and go somewhere else and use somebody else's material in somebody else's kiln and have some ability to transfer your experience into that new situation. And, you know, that's the kind of thing where it can help to have a little bit more of a kind of scientific perspective on, on what's going on to really understand those things broadly. And that's, I think, uh, you know, Ben, what you're talking about and the difference between correlation and causation is that if you can connect your experience of working in the kiln yard and in the studio with you know somewhat more general ideas in, in physics and chemistry that's where you can start to sort of start to stitch together different people's experience and understand how they're consistent with one another right and then that's where a kind of more uh, you know the real causation can kind of come out of that is uh, by reconciling what people di what different people know about their their own context um, one thing that I always try to do is to is to think of this a little bit more, especially since I've been around so many mining operations, is to think of it more of a, as an art than a science because I'm working with a big bulldozer, a big excavator. And whenever I take somebody out with me or I'm with somebody and we find clay, I always want to look at what we see as the clay. Let's say we've got three feet of clay. I want to look at that clay as three clay seams, the first foot, the second foot, the third foot. Maybe they'll all look the same, but you never know when the third foot ruins the top two feet. So I always look at it that way. Then I always look at what's above what I think's the clay and what I think's what is below the clay that might contaminate it. How bad is it going to be if this gets in here and how bad is it going to be if I go too deep? And um, I think just looking at things that basically um, then I say, okay, here's my clay seam. One, two, and three all look good. I'm going to throw them all together, and I'm going to hand it to Takaro and say, here's this little piece I fired. I threw one, two, and three together. It looks plastic. What do you want to do with that? I'm not going to try to tell him put 3% feldspar in there and use it at cone seven or something. I'm not going to do that. That's for, that's for somebody that, that, that deals more with what they're trying to do in pottery than what I do. But I kind of try to approach it that simply. I want to define the clay seam. I want to see what, and you never know. I can explain to you like with gold art, gold art seam is two feet in the middle of six feet. It used to be four foot above two feet. When it was four foot above two feet in the eighties, y'all had problems with it. We changed that to two feet in the middle. Sometimes that can make all the difference. You make certain that you're not going to put too much pyrite in it. If you've been around a while and you know anything about gold art in the early eighties, you probably know about bloats and pop-outs and all kinds of stuff. And we fixed that in 1985 because we took two feet instead of four feet. And sometimes it's that simple. So when you go looking for clays and you find something, 
Don't look at the clay seam like this. Look at the clay seam like that. Because there might be something really special. It may be one foot. But that one foot may be really special to what you want to do. Uh, ben, sorry. I don't know if I understand your question well. <laughs> Co causation and the Co yeah. So one of the yeah. things that we can think about is cause and effect. So if uh, I put uh, this clay in this kiln and fire it this way, mm -hmm. it'll happen that way every single time. Mm -hmm. So that's cause and effect. Mm -hmm. Correlation is where we do it maybe three out of four times, mm -hmm. and we think we're getting the end result because of the amount of gas that was in the kiln uh, or the amount of wood that was in the kiln or what type of wood you were firing. I see. But actually, it turns out that it was neither the wood or the gas. It had to do with the way that it was cooled, <laughs> which actually has to do with all the research that Hideo was on. So right. does, okay. that, does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense. Um, I don't know if this is really um, answering the question or not, but when, when we get the clay from steep or uh, ground, then, of course, we test it. And then we are hoping to be like corn six cray or corn ten cray in the United States because I was surprised that everything is categorized for corn six and corn ten and all four uh, for United States ceramics um, most of the uh, places. But I personally, I like if the cray is fired in corn eight or corn four, I want to fire corn four. So it's not like uh, making it to the way you want to do. So like it, we want to have a content cray, so we try to make it to content is not the way I want to do. But for Starworks, we cannot send the con 16 high temperature cray to you guys and then just fire con 16. It, <laughs> It doesn't work, right? So we test it and then make sure that uh, definitely fire okay at content. So, but that's testing is always a little tricky. Uh, when we tested the smaller scale, the bigger scale, it's a little bit different. So we constantly adjusting the recipe to make it work. Sorry, maybe that's not you answering uh, you, uh, your question. Yeah. But. Cone 16 or bust. I think that's the, <laughs> the sticker, right? <laughs> so uh, who, who has questions that would like to ask anyone? Okay, come on up. Well, while he's coming up, I just want to say something real quick too. Um, part of this, like the, the causation, cause and effect and all that stuff too, like I remain really open to like things that I didn't expect. And those are the exciting things. Like when we find a clay that we think we already know what it is and it ends up burning buff and it blows our minds. Or I just dug a clay that I thought was incredibly mediocre. And, and, and like I mixed it with a little bit of ball clay and whatever, what, sometimes it's like, this is a, not a great clay, but like, I mixed it with a little bit of ball, and whatever was going on with those particles, man, were, it just like, holy smokes, I never would have imagined. It was magical. It was like the eutectic. It just did, it just, whatever it needed, it got. So you can answer the, ask the question now. <laughs> but like, if, you, if you're not open to that, you're going to miss, you're going to miss out on stuff. Yeah, so I live uh, not far from here uh, in Pekin, and we have about three acres, and it's really all clay. When it, when it rains, the water just runs off the surface of the land. It goes down our driveway like a river if it's been raining hard for a couple of days. So I know there's clay, but I'm also curious about what when you guys go out and look for clay, what are you looking for? Because... I know there's clay everywhere here. I have a five gallon bucket I want to bring here of this yellowish clay. So, but I don't, when you- Yeah, bring it. Yeah, no, so I, I'm curious about that. How do you look for clay? Because maybe I'd get a, uh, a bucket in there and dig down about three feet, but I don't know. I would just use it, like just dig it out of your driveway and just start dig, yeah. going for it, man. Yeah. Yeah, so, but how do you look for clay? 
Well, one thing, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm good at a couple of things. I'm good at finding geologic, geologic survey references, and I'm real good at Googling the right phrases to find stuff. I, 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 can, I, can, I can find good stuff on the Internet pretty easily. So when you say, like, you're in, in Pekin, and uh, I go back to, to, to geological references and, and history of the area. Now, that's north of here, right? No, that's south. South of, in southern Montgomery County, we're in a Triassic Basin. Down there. South of Canada. South, yeah. Okay, when you go all the way from Cander to Ellerby on two, old 220, you're in a, an area that has a white clay that we mine. Takaro calls it Cander material. Uh, it's in the pictures. It's that. It's that. It's that. It's that. It's that. Um, and, and and it's and it's below it's below sand. That's it too. That's the sand deposit. So that's uh, sand. That's sand above it. You got to be you got to be in the sand area. If you come past the sand, it, it won't be there. But that was mined at Ellerby, and and Taylor Clay mines it for white brick. They use it in some of their stoneware products. But that's one that's that's in this area. So what I do is somebody tells me they're in an area. You could tell me right now I live in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee. Do I have clay? I bet within 30 minutes on the internet I could find a reference to where there was a pottery in 1890. It'll probably give me a location. And they'll probably be, if I sort around a little bit, I can probably find that they dug clay in their backyard. So then we find the location, we find the backyard, and we just see if there's any geological references there that, or visual stuff that we can see to say they must have been getting it out of this valley. Uh, through Alamance County, Randolph County here, uh, Seagrove doesn't have a lot of clay. You'd think there was some major deposit of clay here. There's really not. There were some little areas where there were some small floodplain clays. Mitchfield clay is a little bit of a stretch to even call out a clay, but that's the local <laughs> that's the local clay everybody kind of gets excited about. But it's it's not it's not real clay. Nobody can throw with it. Um, but that's that's what I do is I start there and uh, and usually um, in most geographic areas that you find in the country there'll be some Somebody made some Crocs or somebody made something 120 years ago and uh, they were using something in their backyard. They usually weren't going very far to get it. And that's where I start personally. Well, that's good advice. I'll, I'll check that out. But also, can, can, just talk to people, man. Talk to farmers. Talk to excavators. Anyone doing road work. Mm -hmm. I mean, construction sites. Like, just drive around with a shovel and look in ditches. It's, I mean... <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> yeah. you, you. May I say one thing? Yes. You said you found the clay on your property, mm -hmm. right? So I think any kind of clay you found is great. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, you may not be able to use just by itself, but you could mix up with the other clay, or you could use that as a strip. Or you could make a graze out of that too. Sure. So if you can find uh, any clay that's uh, precious, you can get in the bucket and then test it out. Try it out. Yes, try it out. Let, yeah, let, that's the spirit. Yeah. Just try it out. Let, let me tell you how some things work. There's a picture there of, of I haven't seen it, but I know it's there somewhere. Josh and I with with a piece of clay in our mouths. Uh, that was mined. That clay is about. 15 miles south of here in a sand mine. And I work with the same sand company to get what we call Lemon Springs or Cameron Clay, not out of that site. So I'm down there, and anytime you have sand, you have a chance to find a lens of clay. And I was down there, and I found a lens of clay, and I had a little baggie in the back of my pickup truck. And anybody that knows me always looks in the back of my pickup truck, because that's where the clay's going to be. Uh, I stopped and saw Ben O, and Ben says, what's that? And I gave Ben a little piece of it and left him with that and with by that evening he had called me and said what was that <laughs> so i told him where it came from i go back uh i take fred johnson with me that we found a little pot of clay it wasn't big enough for me to do anything with it wasn't very massive but fred called it butterfat it was so pure and so clean in a very small pot so there for about eight months 
everybody that had an interest in it went down and and saw the butterfat clay till the sand company, without telling me, got rid of it. We've not found it since. But sometimes it's something that simple. But, but that clay was unbelievable if we'd have been able to. We never found enough of it to commercially or, or even to try to dig it. Um, but sometimes it's just something that simple. But it's recognizing something different. I'm telling you, all y'all would recognize something special. And when I find something special, if somebody can get it in a potter's hands real quick, throw this so that they can tell me from, because I can tell pretty much, but I'm not a thrower. When they go, this is really special. And that's what Ben did that night. Ben said, oh my gosh, what was that? I've not seen that. Type but I think what something special means is a lot of different things. And what I would say is that that clay's on your land, it automatically is special. It's already special <laughs> because it's on your land. I mean, it might not be like the clay that I was just talking about. Uh, we bought a new property and I did a bunch of drainage work on it. And, and, and that clay was special to me because it was coming out of that property and if I had seen it somewhere else, I never would have messed with it. But it was only because it was there on my place. And, and, and you know, the narrative, the story, all this kind of stuff, that matters. It ma it, and it should. It should. And so, you know, it's not always the physical properties of the clay. It can be the story, the history. Like, we just found a really cool legacy clay and, and like, I love that part about it. Like, it's, it's, it's actually the more interesting part to me. I mean, I like that it works well, but the idea that it was an old clay that, you know, O.L. Batchelder was using is like kind of the coolest part. Well, that's great. Thank you all so much. All right. This is Zach Serkey. Zach Serkey is part of the Wild Clay Club. <laughs> hey, Welcome, guys. Zach. Man, I've, I've had a sort of parallel path and been in touch with you guys forever. And you all have all been very good friends and mentors to me. And... There's a couple of things I'd like you to speak to, um, and that, that's about finding meaning in the story of geology and to get clarification on the textbook definition of how clay is made, right? This is something I don't think we talked about. I heard you guys talk about, but it's, we, I've heard you, we've talked about it a lot. I've heard you talk about it in the most enlightening way, Steve, in the past. Um, textbook clay story is feldspathic rocks on mountaintops get rained on the alkaline minerals in the feldspar dissolve flow with water out to the sea and we have the salt water in our oceans because of it on the mountaintop we have left alumina, silica water and oxygen trying to find some beautiful arrangement of atoms and they find it in the little hexagon kaolin particles that then get either wa washed down and mixed with other stuff, maybe, sorted by water, and then we go dig it up. Um, or it stays on the mountain with other chunks of rocks, and we dig it up, secondary primary clay. Steve, what you told me about how Cedar Heights clays were mined, the relationship between coal seams and clay beds blew my mind. And I'll briefly describe it. I'd like you to expand on it. Um, you described the coal and the clay being deposited as more or less the same mucky material, full of carbon, full of silt, in an ancient swamp. And that the difference between the clay layer and the coal layer was how much water, fresh water, was flowing through the deposition environment, dissolving and oxidizing the carbon material, leaving the plant ash behind, the sort of unconsolidated amorphous minerals, and then the kaolin crystals that were in that deposit go in there with their beautiful organization and seed everything. And that's where each unique kind of clay vein gets its character. I know, I just wanted you to speak to like living geology, all the things that go on in the ground with water in a kind of con continuum, not just a static rocks from the mountain go down into the valley kind of thing. 
Okay. Um, everybody's probably much familiar with gold art clay. Um, I mentioned earlier that in, in, in North Carolina, you also have a coal deposit. Um, I'll just briefly talk about how bituminous coal forms. Uh, you got to think about uh, this is 300 plus million years ago, geologic time, and we were at the equator. So we were in a tropical zone. You were in a tropical zone that would have been like a, just a tropical rainforest with um, a lot of uh, vegetation. Um, and the land mass itself kept raising and lowering. And every time it would raise up, it would get above sea level and it would drop and get buried again. Uh, in Ohio, that raising and lowering happened about 53 times. And they call that, that a cyclotherm, that cycle of, of raising and lowering. And every time that it would raise up, it would be dry land and then it would sink and get buried. Um, again, we're at the, we're at the equator. So when the, when it got shallow enough that, that, that plants could grow, uh, you actually had a lush forest. And then as the water level started to change a little bit, it became more like a swamp. As long as the swamp had fresh water, you had decaying vegetation that was taken away, you had plant ash accumulating, uh, and uh, you didn't preserve much carbon. So as this keeps happening in there, you're accumulating this, this, this freshwater muck, that's uh, got a lot of plant ash, it's got some fine sediments, again, we're in a swamp. Uh, we're building up a clay layer. As soon as that swamp got to where the water level was, was such that it became stagnant, we no longer were bringing in new sediment, we no longer were decaying vegetation, we were preserving vegetation that becomes eventually peat. Then, as we build this peat bog over this mucky stuff that's down below it, if the water level, if the, if the land mass sank and the water level came up, we now buried that under new sediments. We're accumulating shales and limestones and all kinds of stuff. Then the land mass comes up again and we start doing this process of, of swamp formation again. Uh, in, in the Ohio and in the West Virginia, Pennsylvania area, maybe 12, 14 times this cycle worked out well enough that you had a major coal seam. And oddly enough, they're almost always geologically about 50 feet apart. So you got 14 major coal seams dotted across um, uh, that part of the country. Uh, each one of them formed the same way under the same situations, and a lot of them have a clay seam under it. But oddly enough, if we number those clay seams 1 to 14, the good clays are under number 3, 4, and 5. You won't find good clays up above the, the fifth uh, layer of coal for whatever reason. Um, but gold art is under number 5, and it's 2 feet of a 6-foot seam of this, this material. And that coal seam, that swamp, went all the way from central Kentucky through Oak Hill, Ohio, where it's mined, up through uh, central Ohio, up around Canton, turned and headed over to central Pennsylvania, turned and went down towards Frostburg, Maryland. Big horseshoe of the same swamp. At one time, you could have walked on the swamp from one of that side to the other when it was at the equator. But so all through that belt, you find these, these clay seams, and the seam that the gold art comes out of is the most predominant in that whole horseshoe, and it was used over probably 500 miles of that belt. But, but, but the different things that when you think about the coal and the clay forming together, when Taco and I found the coal seam over in Sanford, North Carolina, it was the same thing. We, but we found, we found a clay that had a low maturing temperature. It wasn't refractory like gold art would be. But I will tell you something interesting about gold art. I worked in Oak Hill for, for uh, almost 20 years. There was never a pottery in Oak Hill. There was never a pottery at any time in Southern Ohio because the gold art is too refractory. 
But if you go north about uh, 100 miles, you hit Zanesville, Roseville, Crooksville, which was a major, major, major ceramic center. Go further up around that horseshoe and you run into East Liverpool, another major ceramic center, because the fire clays had about a five cone lower maturing temperature and you could make stuff out of it besides a fire brick. That's incredibly detailed. <laughs> <laughs> Great. What I think you had an announcement, Takro, you have to make about the clay biz. Okay. Sorry, this is Starbucks supply shop business. Uh, everyone who wants to buy clay, go downstairs by 4.30 and pay and finish the paperwork because we don't have anyone in the supply shop tomorrow. So if you do have an order, please go down there by 4.30. Thank you so much for um, trying out Starbucks Cray. Well, I think that's a, a great segue, actually, to talk about how um, all of you guys can support the research that's up here. So there's this great cyclical relationship where they discover clay, they mine clay, they make clay, but then ultimately all of you are the ones that are going to help test this. So support Starworks Clay because they're doing a great thing. So let's give them a round of applause. And, and then I also just wanted to thank the rest of the members of the panel for coming today. I'm sure they'd be willing to answer maybe any of your questions after this. Um, so thanks, you all, for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben. I'd like to thank Steve, Takaro, Josh, and Hideo for coming on the show, as well as the folks that put on the Envision Woodfire Conference. Mary and Nancy and, and a bunch of the other staff there worked tirelessly to make this conference happen, so I really appreciate them asking me to be a part of this. This will be the first in a series of ongoing episodes that relate to that conference, but I'm going to sprinkle them in over the next couple months so you don't get too oversaturated with wood fire knowledge. If you'd like to find out more about Starworks, including their residency, you can go to starworksnc.org. Also wanted to thank today's sponsors, including Amico Brent and the Rosenfeld Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor on the podcast, you can get in touch through the network website. That's brickyardnetwork.org. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you all for tuning in. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. We respectfully acknowledge and honor all indigenous communities whose lands we reside on in the United States and recognize that we are uninvited guests on the occupied, unceded, and ancestral lands of over 500 nations indigenous to North America. By acknowledging and reflecting upon the contemporary lived experiences and histories of the indigenous peoples here and globally, we may begin to take essential steps towards creating a more equitable world. Learn more through the hashtag Honor Native Land Initiative of the U.S. Department of Arts and Culture and consider contributing to Indigenous-led organizations doing important work to further health and wellness, sovereignty, and self-determination of the first people of the lands you reside. This podcast is a production of the Brickyard Network, an extension of the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. To find out more about our lineup of ceramic podcasts, visit brickyardnetwork.org.